Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much for your uh, being here with me, uh, sharing this uh, moment, and thank uh, all the conference organization for inviting me and for having me here. It's a pleasure to join this uh, huge conference. I've been checking the last few hours, and it's uh, an amazing program. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. As I told Jennifer a few minutes ago, I'm I'm here in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm uh, so thank you for joining us in this international track. Uh, I know that we had uh, people from all over the world, and it's uh, it's a, I think it's a big responsibility for me to to be here on behalf of La of Latin America, which is a, a a big region with a lot of people from the free software and the open source community uh, around. So it's uh, I'm. I'm Thank you very much for inviting me and for sharing this uh, uh, space with me. And uh, let's uh, try to do this uh, somehow informal. Uh, let's try to have a conversation. So feel free to, to join with the, your questions uh, through the chat or through, through the Q, uh, uh, questions and answers sp space. So Jennifer will be here helping us. Um, so when I, I, I was invited to uh, talk to you about the situation in Latin America, I thought about many things, especially many things that happened that, and that are currently happening around this uh, so uh, strange situation and this uh, situation uh, derived from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is uh, being especially violent here in Latin America. Many of the countries of our regions are in the top uh, 10 of the most impacted countries uh, due to the um, number of people dying every day for this uh, terrible uh, situation. And, and I think most of the things we've been thinking along all these years around development and the situation of our continent are uh, being brought to light, to, to light uh, due to this situation. Um, I don't know how much you know Latin America, but uh, we can start by saying that Latin America uh, is the, the most one is the most unequal region in the world. Many times when we think about poverty and 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 dramatic uh, situations around poverty, we think about Africa as, uh, as 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 a continent especially affected by poverty. But uh, even while Latin America is also affected by poverty, uh, the, the main characteristic, characteristic that we have here in Latin America is inequality. Uh, for example, just to give you an example, we have a, a huge uh, poverty rates, while we have one of the billionaires of the world, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the most richest guy in the world is from Latin America, is from Mexico, and his name is Carlos Slim, who is always uh, in the in one in the first or the second uh, place, uh, considering the richest people. So uh, the main problem here in Latin America is inequality. It's not only poverty, but considering uh, the development rates, um, we have huge inequality, even within countries. Um, I was telling Jennifer a few minutes ago that I, I am here in Buenos Aires. I don't know how many of you uh, have been here or around here, but Buenos Aires is one of the richest uh, cities in, in Latin America. Um, but if you go to the north of the country, you will see a population that is uh, living in extremely po uh, poverty, in extreme poverty. Just to uh, to let you know a, a few numbers of the situation regarding development. And then I, I would try to go to the topic that brings us here, which is free software and open access. Um, but first, I, I would like to give you some context. Um, for example, in Argentina, in the last uh, numbers are telling us that 40%, around 40% of the population is under the poverty line, which is a big number. and there is a, a, another very dramatic number, which is which uh, shows us uh, that in Argentina, 55% 55% of kids under 15 years old 
is on the poverty line. So our future is uh, compromised by poverty. 55% of kids in Argentina under 15 years old is under poverty line. That means a lot in a country uh, which a difference from other countries has uh, a cult on public education. Argentina is one of the countries that has uh, um, uh, the hugest, the, uh, the biggest um, public education system, which includes uh, primary education, secondary college and universities, uh, which is a, a um, a big difference between Argentina and other countries in the region. But even while having this situation regarding education, we still have a huge amounts of uh, uh, poverty and people living under the poverty line. Uh, the context for the rest of the region is not, uh, not uh, much better. Argentina is one uh, of the countries that has uh, um, in a best, uh, in a better record on development measures, together with Uruguay, we are in the in the top fifty countries uh, in in considering human development. But we also have Bolivia, which had elections last uh, last Sunday, and we also have Brazil, which also has. Uh, a, a big amounts of inequality with rich cities like Rio de Janeiro, but impacting, but the, the, the pandemic impacting very hard in the big cities like Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and the north of Brazil with a, a big um, poverty rates. The same applies for Chile, which is one of the more unequal countries in the region. Also, it is a country which is uh, now dealing with a lot of protests and, 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 and demonstrations in the streets. So uh, Latin American citizens are mobilized and are, are in the streets and are uh, dealing with the situation uh, regarding inequality. Um, inequality is a main characteristic in, in, Latin, in Latin America. Um, going to our topic, uh, which I think uh, uh, is a, the main uh, interest topic that uh, brings you here, uh, especially to the conference and also to this uh, um, uh, uh, talk we are having now, uh, I would like to do some uh, memories on the history of the free software a community in Latin America, which is a strong, which is uh, very vocal, and which uh, has been working on public policy around the continent, um, but still has a lot of things to do. Well, let me introduce a little bit uh, my organization. My organization is a, a, a private foundation. It's a foundation here in 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 our region. We have the civil. Uh, the, the, it is a civil society nonprofit organization. Um, it's a, a, it it was born uh, twenty years ago. We are uh, celebrating our. Uh, 20th anniversary in November this year. We we uh, we were born uh, from the heart of the free software community, and we are Via Libre Foundation is one of the oldest organizations, one uh, one of the first free software organizations in the region. Um, we've uh, we've learned a lot, and uh, we've been working together with the Free Software Foundation for many years, and in fact, our organization was born. Uh, from the heart of the free software community, which was uh, very, very active during the 90s uh, with the typical organizations of the Linux users groups, as, as many of you uh, uh, um, may have heard before, the, the typical Linux users groups. Uh, but our, our founders uh, thought that uh, to improve the situation of uh, free software and to accomplish a mission of free software, the, the values of free software, uh, we needed to have public policies regarding free software, especially the, with, the using, with the use of free software um, in the public sector. Uh, we've been very, very, um, uh, um, we, we, we try to uh, um, have a, a free software law 
to make the public sector um, uh, to to use a, a mandatory law to use a free software in the public sector. We uh, were we working on this in the beginning of our our organization because we thought that many things uh, regarding data privacy. Yes, 20 years ago, we've been talking about these issues. Uh, well, together with the Free Software Foundation, with the EFF, with Computers Professional for Social Responsibility and other old, older organizations like that, uh, we've been worried about the use of data in the state, uh, the autonomy and the capacity and the creation of capacity within the states. Uh, we've been, uh, we, we sustained that free software was an, an enabler um, for the capacity building within the state. And in countries like uh, Argentina, but mostly in the region, the state has a, a huge role uh, in empowering uh, innovation and also in, in empowering um, development. Uh, we always thought that uh, the state had a role uh, in development. And for that, having um, public policies uh, supporting and using free software was a must uh, within that uh, agenda, the, uh, the development agenda. Um, um, so that was uh, our first mission was to, to, to have a public policy uh, to support the use of free software within the state administration and national level and local level. We, we succeed with many, many things. For example, in the province of Santa Fe, there is a law that it makes mandatory the use of free software or uh, in, the, in the public administration. And that uh, is very helpful uh, to support a local community of development, of support, of services, and many other services and many, uh, many other things um, around the, the, the use of free software within the state. But we also made focus on another issue that we consider that is a, a very, very important thing uh, in a, to deal with the development goals is that using free software in education. Um, we also had the, the idea of free software in education as one of the main instruments uh, to, to develop uh, capacities to develop autonomy to develop the all the, the the needs that we have to improve in order to have um and uh, to improve our development goals thinking about uh free software and development is one of the issues that I would like to pose in this in this conversation that I would like to address in this conversation um, there is also another issue that I would like to address in this conversation with you and has to do with the other uh, uh, line of work we have in, 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 in Via Libre Foundation that is also one of the main issues that we have to consider in Latin America is that all the intellectual property laws uh, that we have in our region. After the WTO uh, approval of the TRIPS, uh, I don't know how familiar are you with the international regulations on intellectual property, so I'll, uh, maybe I will be a little introductory, uh, so we, we have a common basis. Uh, after the approval of the TRIPS agreement, the trade-related aspects of uh, intellectual property within the uh, World Trade Organization, that was in the middle of the 90s, 1995 to be precise, um, all of our countries, uh, all of our countries uh, approved and, and and signed the TRIPS agreement, and that made us sign a, a, a commitment to have a, a common ground on intellectual property laws. Uh, this common ground on intellectual property laws made a, a, an harmonization on this uh, regulation that impacted in a different way uh, the developed countries and the countries that are less developed or in developing countries like uh, Argentina, Brazil and other countries in our region. Um, 
at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000, uh, the debate on intellectual property became uh, very important, especially considering the, uh, the, the um, coalition, the coalition between human rights and intellectual property. And that brings me to something that is uh, very, very, uh, it, it's, it's part of the current de debate on WTO and intellectual property. Last week, for example, the TRIPS Council had a meeting at the, inter the WTO, the, the TRIPS Council is the one dealing with the intellectual property, and they um, couldn't agree on a proposal to, uh, for a waiver in intellectual property regulations um, attending the COVID-19 pandemic necessities for for the developing countries. So I think this debate is still uh, very necessary and is still a key debate that we have to focus. And many times the, the free software community uh, is not aware that uh, free software is not only a matter of technical issues, but it is also a matter of, of public policy, but it is mainly an, a, a matter of intellectual property. Uh, in fact, uh, let me let me tell you something about me and, and, and what I've done as a professional. I started being a, a free software activist. I, I'm, I don't have um, a technical background. I'm, I have a mass communication degree, so I come from humanity, humanities. So I, I'm, I'm not very proficient with uh, technical stuff, but I am, I've been a, a free software user since the last 20 years. So uh, I'm a free software activist, but I have to learn a lot of things, uh, new things for me, uh, because of uh, not being a, a, a technical profile. But I, I studied, um, I had my master's degree in intellectual property. And I, I've been working the last 15 years on this intersection between uh, free software, free access to knowledge and intellectual property regulations. And that's where I, I usually focus, especially with the, uh, regarding the issues of development and human rights, which are totally, totally um, related. We cannot think about development without uh, considering human rights as part of this development. This, the right to have a, a, of dignity, the right to have a, a good, job, the right to have education, the right to have culture, the right to have health, uh, and all the things that the human rights are already set as set for us as to the basic uh, demands that as civil society we, we have to do. But going back to what I was telling you about intellectual property, in Latin America, intellectual property debate was a huge debate for many years, and it was uh, uh, posed on the public debate uh, seen uh, by the free software community many times, especially in countries like Brazil. Um, I have to say that uh, one of the sad things in our region is that we cannot have uh, state policy. You know, it's like uh, a We've, it, it is our region is a very convulsionate one. It's not a very, very stable. Our democracies are not so stable. So um, when a government starts a debate and then comes another um, and blocks everything that's, that was done with that. And I think a, a big example on that is Brazil. Brazil is a, a, a very, very interesting, interesting uh, debate. Um, uh, on intellectual property, especially uh, during the Lula da Silva government and then Dilma Rousseff government, uh, when they proposed free software as public uh, policy, uh, the free software community in Brazil was very strong and they proposed uh, two uh, ways of uh, of uh, debating things. One was a debate on the intellectual property law uh, and, the, um, and the, the situation regarding the author's rights uh, debate. They had a, a very open, a very wide debate on a new intellectual property law for Brazil, which was excluded from the uh, Marco Civil, which is something like a constitution of rights uh, for Brazilians, which is uh, 
in fact, one of the main uh, goals that uh, the government of uh, Lula and Dilma had, and it was a big success, but they couldn't make it with the author's rights and intellectual property law. Something like that happened also in Argentina, where we've been looking for uh, flexibilities to the intellectual property law around uh, our country for many years with uh, no success at all. Our uh, intellectual property law is from 1933 and it's very strict. We don't have flexibilities for education. We don't have flexibilities or limitations to authors' rights and, and to copyright for uh, libraries or for people with disabilities. It's a very, very strict law which makes it one of the most strict laws in the in the region. And that is also blocking development because of access to um, access to uh, educational materials. I am also a professor at the University of Buenos Aires in the career of mass communication. And we had our first uh, semester on uh, remote classes. And after our first semester uh, ended, uh, we made a, a queue with a, a, a questionnaire with all our students. And 40% of our students said, that they didn't have access to printed materials or books. That is 40% of our students at the University of Social Sciences in Argentina and Buenos Aires uh, had no access to printed materials. And they, they had the materials online just because their professors like me violated the law. We committed crimes to provide them with the uh, um, educational materials they needed um, for for having their courses in a regular way in the, the uh, in in a in a normal or or something between the emergency situation and normal um, and that shows that uh, this kind of regulation is in imposing limitations on how we impart education in Argentina the same is happening in all levels uh, just this week uh, kids are going back to to schools in Argentina, uh, some of them, uh, just a few of them. So most of the kids are taking, uh, are having uh, online classes and they, they depend completely on the digitization of the materials. And we don't have any uh, flexibility on, on the educational materials within our law. And we don't have any emergency um, regulation that uh, helps us, that uh, liberates us from committing crimes. So free software is a, a basic. Uh, our state has no policy on the matter. In fact, we've been having a lot of meetings with the government, with the Ministry of Education, of Security, and other offices uh, within the government, and they are using uh, proprietary software for having meetings uh, uh, that are um, with that, that need uh, that compromise privacy and that need a huge amount of security, and they are not uh, uh, having the capacity to uh, deal with their own uh, developments in in regarding technology. So free software is needed here in Argentina. We have one strength, and uh, it's something that is really good that we have, as, as I already mentioned, public universities, and uh, our public universities are very very committed to free software, most of them, and and they, we have developers, and we have a lot of a, a few a free software community that is very active so we have an opportunity there that we could explore in the future years i'm receiving a few questions that i, I i'm uh, mauricio thank you very much uh, two questions from mauricio and also i would like to hear from you if you have uh, more questions uh, let me read the questions so i try to to have enough time to um to address them as well. Uh, are there any coalition groups for developers who are proficiency with indigenous language, Quechua, Guarani? Yes. Um, well, there is a uh, there is a, a huge community here in Latin America um, of Wikipedians. Uh, and I, I don't know how familiar are you, Mauricio, with the Wikimedia community? Uh, but if you are interested in this uh, indigenous or on, on uh, languages, I uh, strongly uh, recommend you to 
get in contact with the Wikimedia community. With the Wikimedia community is one of the most active communities of open access and free knowledge in the region, together with the Creative Commons community, which is also very active in the region. I, I, I'd like to say that um, even while the olders are the people from the free software community, uh, Creative Commons has a lot of uh, people very active here in the region, especially in Uruguay, here in Argentina. I'm also a member of the uh, Creative Commons uh, network here in Argentina. There's also um, people uh, in Chile, in uh, Brazil, of course. Brazil is so big that they have active uh, groups in all over the place and especially because they were very very strong during the 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 uh, Lula and Dilma the organization they became very very strong very visible so they they became a, a, a strong communities with a lot of visibility and a impact in public policy but also there is a strong communities in Colombia and uh, in Venezuela as well I know uh, that you are asking about how are developers in Venezuela coping with their current economic climate well I'm not very familiar with the current economic situation in Venezuela, but I know the crisis and I know the situation of, uh, of the, the political crisis, which is something permanent and very sad in Venezuela. Um, but I'm not very familiar with the situation, but particular situation in Venezuela. Uh, I'm uh, I have contacts with the people from Venezuela because I I belong to networks uh, where they, there's a lot of people from from the rest of the region, and there's of course people from Venezuela. Uh, but I'm not very familiar with the situation in in Venezuela. Sorry, Mauricio, I cannot uh, uh, answer this uh, this question with the. Uh, uh, very well, because I, I, I certainly I don't know. But the, your first question, Mauricio, about the, these uh, indigenous languages, uh, there is also groups in um, in Mexico uh, working with the Mesoamerican languages, with the uh, with the communities uh, in in the, with the indigenous languages and indigenous communities, and they are also talking a lot and having. Uh, interest conversations about uh, intellectual property and indigenous uh, communities, which is a big, a big topic, uh, especially in Mesoamerica and in in Mexico, especially in Mexico, uh, there is a uh, a lot of debate on intellectual property and indigenous peoples. Um, uh, there is a lot of work in recovering and, and saving the voices of indigenous uh, peoples uh, here in, in, in the region. I recommend you, Mauricio, to get in contact with the Wikimedia community, um, which has uh, special projects working on, well, there is a, Wiki, a Wikipedia in Quechua, in Guarani, uh, also in Mapudungun, which is the language of the of the Mapuches here in the, the Patagonia, the, the limit, the, the border between Chile and Argentina. Um, there, there are, there's also Wikipedia in Aymara, which is one of the languages in, from Bolivia, from the plurinational state of Bolivia. Uh, so uh, uh, there is uh, there is a, a big uh, development there. Well, I don't know how big because you know there is a, a big gap between access to technologies and and the communities. And I think one of the main issues we still have to address in Latin America is the digital divide, uh, which still affects most of the population here in Argentina and in all the region. I think I, I would uh, we'd also address some issues regarding the digital divide and some um, plans that we had in the region. Uh, Latin America was one of the places where we had these experiments of the one one uh, laptop per child uh, that was so uh, um, it, it, so uh, visible a few years ago. Um, and I think in this situation of pandemia, where the kids are at home taking classes from home, uh, these kind of uh, things are, um, are, are, are an interesting resource. But the only country that still has the one laptop per child uh, project and that made it 
ex exclusively with free software is Uruguay. Uruguay had the, this, uh, mm, this project that they call it Seibal project. I don't know if you are aware of this uh, project. Uh, Seibal project was uh, the application of one laptop per child uh, in Uruguay. Uruguay is a country, it's a small country uh, with 3 million people, uh, which is uh, something like a one, one uh, province in Argentina. It's comparable to the province of Santa Fe. It's a, it's a very small country. So this kind of uh, public policy are, are much uh, uh, easier to do, to implement that in, than in countries bigger than Uruguay, like Brazil or uh, Argentina. But we could say that uh, Uruguay and the, um, the Seibal project was one of the most interesting uh, um, impulses of free software within the region. Um, we also had here in Argentina uh, different programs with the same aim of uh, giving computers to students. We have two plans, one here in the city of Buenos Aires with a, what was called uh, Plan Sarmiento, which was provided one computer to each kid of public uh, schools in the primary uh, level um, with a double boot with Windows and a Debian. These computers had a, a Debian distribution. And they're also then at the national level, we had uh, a, a um, project called Conectar Igualdad. Uh, it's connecting equality. That was uh, that's uh, the translation for conectar igualdad from Spanish to English. Uh, um, um, connect equality, which uh, has this idea of uh, uh, providing equipment for for uh, students was one of the main uh, things for for gaining equality, which is uh, as I said at the beginning, one of the main problems in the region. Um, but this program, Conectar Igualdad, was a very active. They delivered millions, millions of computers uh, to students uh, at a secondary level for to all the country. This, uh, this uh, program impacted the whole country from north to south. Um, uh, these computers had windows. We were in a very, very hard debate of, uh, well, we said don't use Windows, but Microsoft had a, a very influence uh, policy and they provided very, very cheap um, uh, agreements with the government. So they had Windows in the machines, but they had also uh, a Debian based uh, distribution uh, called WIDA. Uh, and WIDA was a, a Debian-based distribution that was uh, provided by the Ministry of Education, developed by the Ministry of Education with a lot of educational resources. And that was a, a very, very interesting initiative. The, the, the problem there was that um, they delivered the machines, they deliver a lot of manuals, a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, they also deliver a lot of information on free software. Um, but uh, the, the problem was that uh, the, most of the professors were not committed to free software and they opted uh, for using Windows instead of the free uh, uh, software distro in the machine. So that uh, had a different impact uh, regarding the penetration of free software. It was a big opportunity that uh, sudden, uh, sadly it was uh, suspended when Mauricio Macri got to government uh, when he, uh, when, with the Mauricio Macri administration, he cut all the, uh, this kind of programs, so he suspended. In fact, uh, when he left the government, um, the new Ministry of Education that come, came with the new government of Alberto Fernandez found a deposit with thousands of these computers, new ones in the boxes that were not delivered to the kids during the, uh, the, the former administration. The, the good part was that those computers that were found in deposits of the Ministry of Education uh, are being delivered now to the kids that are not connected during the pandemic. Um, 
but uh, it's uh, very sad to find out that uh, this program that was a very interesting opportunity for educating in free software and to 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 address the digital divide uh, uh, was uh, abandoned that way. Uh, Javier, there is a question here. Are there any NGOs, nonprofit communities that you partnered outside of Latin America and USA, which have a similar? Oh, yes, yes, uh, Javier. We, uh, well, in 20 years, which is uh, our, uh, our life, uh, we've partnered with a lot of people in Europe, in Asia, in, La in the rest of Latin America, and in the US, of course. Uh, in the US, uh, we've been working very close to the Free Software Foundation, as I already mentioned. We are very good friends of Richard Stallman and all this, uh, the group working with him together. Uh, we are also all very good friends of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We, we, we cooperated with them many, many times. We are also members of, um, of the the computer professionals for social responsibility, uh, we are also members of this uh, of this group. But we also uh, partner with uh, uh, people in Europe, with the University of Maastricht, with the Barce with the University of uh, Barcelona, and their program on free software. Uh, we also partner with the Free Software Foundation in Europe. Uh, we also partner with the Free Software Foundation in India. We are also also members of, of different networks. We are members of IT. Uh, we, we are a partner with IT for Change in India. Uh, we are part uh, uh, partners of Just JustNet Coalition. Um, we work very uh, very close to uh, Access Now, uh, which has uh, two representatives working here in Argentina, which are very close to the the main uh, the vision of our organization. Organization. Um, we are also members of other networks that dealing with the, the issues of intellectual property, for example, and the WTO negotiations, which are not uh, technological NGOs, but are uh, dealing with the e-commerce agenda at the WTO, like, for example, our world is not for sale. Uh, um, public citizen uh, and other organizations dealing with intellectual property. We also uh, work with, uh, of course, Creative Commons. We are members of Creative Commons Network. I was always a founder. I, I was as well a founder of uh, Wikimedia Argentina, which is a chapter here of the Wikimedia Foundation in 2007. It's the first uh, chapter in Latin America, and we are happy and proud of um, having mentored many other chapters in the region and uh, yes we are we we work together with a lot of people in an international level um javier also you have a question in spanish thank you <laughs> uh the most valuable thing uh we've been witnessing in the in the recent years and which programs uh we have uh, need help uh now well many things uh, um we have a, a different lines of our work uh one of our lines it i think it deserves a, a whole conversation is ele electronic voting we've been uh, the champions against electronic voting here in argentina and we've been researching and public uh, and reporting vulnerabilities and campaigning and and talking about electronic voting since 2003 uh, when we had the first experience of electronic voting here in argentina in the city of ushuaia which I strongly recommend you to visit. It's a paradise in the south. It's a very beautiful city in the south. Um, but in, in when we started talking about using electronic voting, all our members get, uh, got uh, panicked <laughs> because of the vulnerabilities and the impacts on democracy that electronic voting has. So we've been a champion in against that here. We've been the first ones talking about that in the region. And now we are working together with other countries like uh, Chile, uh, Colombia and Paraguay, which have uh, different uh, projects of implementing electronic voting. Uh, we already gave up uh, in Brazil and Venezuela, uh, which are uh, which have uh, electronic voting deployed 
to all their uh, population and which we consider that is uh, so vulnerable, uh, vulnerable and against the democratic values. I think this is uh, the, the main thing which, uh, which we, we've been working and, and open source and free software has something to say about that because we are always uh, talking about uh, make the, the source code of the machines, the, the voting machines public, but that is uh, uh, necessary, but not enough to trust in electronic voting. So as uh, Richard Stallman said in a prologue of uh, one of our books, uh, we cannot trust on computers for voting, not, not even the free software computers. And uh, that is uh, one of the things uh, most valuable we've done. We stopped the implementation of uh, electronic voting here in, in Argentina, and we are very proud of that. And now, one of the main things we are dealing with is the issue of uh, public surveillance and uh, facial recognition and all the implementation of these uh, things that are impacting on the, on the democracy here in Argentina. In fact, we've been, before entering the conference, I've been talking with our other colleagues here uh, because this week uh, the city of Buenos Aires will approve the use of facial recognition uh, in the streets of uh, Buenos Aires, which we consider is a, a, a very bad impact on democracy and civil liberties here. Um, but we also yeah, are Chris. working. Yes, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Just yeah, just wanting to let you know you have about five minutes left. Yes, yes. I, I um, I don't know if there is uh, other questions uh, or there's a, a lot of things that I can tell you about the region, about the situation here in Argentina and in the rest of the countries. Uh, let me tell you that uh, just to to wrap up, uh, we have a a, a strong free software community in Latin America. Uh, we've been working hard for having uh, a free software as public policy. We succeed in many issues, but we still have a lot uh, to do, uh, especially regarding intellectual property regulations. Um, and I think uh, these debates on intellectual property are, uh, one, are very, very important uh, because of the impact of the pandemic and the need for access to knowledge, access to educational materials, access to uh, research and access to knowledge, not only uh, regarding patents, but also regarding copyright on um, uh, materials for education and uh, research uh, in the public system uh, here in Argentina. Uh, and, and also in the rest of the region where I think, I know they are having similar debates as uh, what we are having here in, in our region. So um, the free software community is very active and will keep pushing for free software for a free society. And just to finish, uh, if you don't have any other questions, um, I was uh, very, very happy to uh, to hear you and to share with you our vision from Latin America and this international track of all things open.